So winning the Tetrahedron Prize was, was, you know, quite a thrill. And part of that comes from its great history. And in fact, two of my former mentors, Gilbert Stork at Columbia and Bob Grubbs at Caltech, um, have won this award in the past. This award is reflects the uh, the great contributions of my research group, my graduate students, and postdoctoral co-workers who have really contributed the lion's share of ideas and certainly all of the of the physical work. When I first learned of receiving this prize, I was completely surprised. I didn't know I was nominated for the prize, uh, and it was just a, a, a great recognition of the work that my students and postdocs have done over the years. I should say I'm kind of an unusual recipient of this award. My roots and my education is really more in transition metal chemistry and inorganic chemistry, and so I'm one of the first, if not the first, to receive this prize in organic synthesis with that kind of a background. research group focuses on developing what are called synthetic methods and these are techniques that are used to put together structures ever more complicated structures and this can be uh, the, the largest application of this is in the pharmaceutical industry so for example a lot of this is used in drug discovery and in drug discovery, what you'll have is a situation where you'll have a large core of a molecule, and then you'll want to make a number of systematic changes on one part. And we've developed techniques that are quite good at, at doing that. And then these are techniques that can not only be used in the discovery phase, but also in uh, going to larger scale preparation of these materials, either for clinical testing and ultimately for manufacture. Well, the research can be applied in a number of areas, certainly. So in addition to pharmaceuticals, it can be applied to electronic materials, such as OLED. It can be used in agrochemicals. It can be used in the preparation of sensors. The chemistry was developed to be field agnostic with respect to its application. It's just that we wanted to be able to create what had been difficult to forge bonds. Well, my research is really focused on developing new reactions of organic compounds that are catalyzed by transition metal complexes. So it's a field that is really a hybrid between uh, transition metal chemistry, organometallic chemistry, coordination chemistry, and applications to organic synthesis. The goals of our research are really multifold. We're trying to really develop basic principles that help the field overall to discover and develop new catalysts, uh, but also to develop new reactions that we hope are very practical and get used by people in all areas of synthetic chemistry, from developing new drugs to new agrochemicals to new you know, light emitting diodes and even components of, of catalysts for new reactions. The work that we've done is inherently interdisciplinary and the field of organometallic chemistry, even in the term, is a hybrid of a couple of fields within chemistry. But we have tried to straddle that line between those two sub-disciplines within chemistry, probably with a third leg that uh, resides in physical organic chemistry, the study of reaction mechanisms. Throughout my career, I think the signatures of our research has been to blend these sub-disciplines of chemistry to enable the development and understanding of these new reactions for organic synthesis. I think the, the challenges that we faced um, were certainly um, moving into areas where we're not experts and maybe not the best at that area, but having an ability to bring to that topic something new. So you might be particularly skilled at one part of that multidisciplinary effort, but less skilled at the other, and then people who are experts at that may look at your work and say, oh, well, that's sort of not as, as, as high a quality as it should be, but you're bringing in this other component. You certainly learn over time and get better and better at, uh, at each of those facets. But that's, I think, true in general for any research that's multidisciplinary. I think that aspect of our program is sort of within the subdiscipline of chemistry, but certainly 
Our research has moved into directions that go outside of chemistry, and many people's research, particularly people making organic molecules, have aspects of the research that draw from material science or from biology. You just have to you know, become better and better and learn more and more and maybe bring in some skill sets from outside to help you uh, translate your research into those areas or to bring those skills to help your own research. I think interdisciplinary research is, is really exciting. We have, for example, a large collaborative effort with Professor Brad Pentaludi in our department in the study of bioconjugation. And what we've done is we took what we had originally developed in the pharmaceutical arena and have been able to, with tremendous interaction from Brad and his co-workers, apply this to larger biomolecules such as proteins and antibodies. And I think there are a lot of applications. Just because you don't know something is no reason to stay away from it. You have to kind of go in there and you're gonna make some mistakes, but you wanna do it with interactions and collaborations for people who will sort of allow you to correct yourself as you gain experience. Science is a team game and it really is the interactions which drive things. I got into chemistry because I had a, uh, a tremendously good high school chemistry teacher, William Lumley. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to be in a National Science Foundation sponsored summer research institute and worked for a young professor, Gary Hefia, when I was still in high school. And that basically taught me that this could be a lot of fun. I then, when I went to college, I worked for Kathy Parker for a, a year and a half and in particular worked closely with a graduate student named Ray Cosley. And, you know, they showed me many places where things could be very exciting and, you know, what, what you had to be concerned about and how to do things the right way. I then spent a summer with Gilbert Stork and that gave me great faith in the process because here was one of the most for famous organic chemists of all time and he was a truly wonderful human being. And then finally, when I went off to do my postdoc with Bob Grubbs, it was really quite fortuitous that I ended up in his laboratory, but it was really, I think, a perfect match. You know, what happens to you as a young faculty member? So I had a lot of help when I came to MIT, and one of the people who was very impactful on me was Barry Sharpless, who's now at Scripps, Nobel laureate. One of the fun aspects is people come in with different cultures and different ways of, of looking at things. And um, I, I encourage them to not give me the answer that they think I want, but to give me the answer that they think is, is correct. And then I tell them I'm gonna argue with them, but in the end, I'm willing to admit if they're right. And a lot of it is they're teaching me new things. That's the great thing. It's, it's like your in college over and over and over again because you're always surrounded by these incredibly smart young people who, you know, challenge you and make fun of you and everything else. So, I mean, that's really the exciting, the most exciting part of the job. Well, of course, there are many people that have served a sort of formal mentorship role, an informal mentorship role through being colleagues, uh, and even mentorship through just publications and reading their papers. My graduate uh, PhD advisors were Bob Bergman and Dick Anderson, both of them together. Dick Anderson's background and, and research focus is really on synthesis of inorganic complexes, and Bob Bergman's is more on the application of physical organic methods to understanding the mechanisms of the reactions that these types of complexes undergo. Dick Anderson was really a role model for how to handle the literature and be very scholarly, and I tried to, to bring that into my own being and so I sort of uh, my own way of, of, of doing research and, and we often think of him as a, as a model for how to be an assistant professor. And Bob Bergman a bit more with a larger group on how to, how to run a research group uh, that's a larger one, but also on how to really be extremely rigorous in the way you conduct mechanistic analysis and the conclusions that you can draw from those data. 
Now my postdoctoral advisor was uh, Steve Lippard, and I worked on in bioinorganic chemistry with Steve, and that's his focus as well, and in almost all of his research, and that is relevant to what I'm doing in a portion of my research now, but for the most of my career wasn't as directly relevant. But what I really learned from Steve was to pick a problem and then just go after that problem and bring in whatever skill set or tools that you need to be able to address that and not to be afraid about changing fields and working in something that you're not an expert because you will become an expert later. I think it's important for people to really communicate with people as much as possible to avoid having blinders about their research direction. They get a lot of input about what, uh, how the research can be important, what are the important problems to solve. But at the same time, we all get negative reviews on papers, negative reviews on proposals, uh, criticism in one way or another. And if we stopped what we were doing every time we got criticized, then I think we would miss some of our greatest accomplishments. So there's a real balance between keeping your ears open and, and, real, and asking questions and listening, and, uh, but having a filter on that so that you don't, uh, you know, so you, you understand what uh, advice is the most important advice. What I've learned is that it doesn't just, it comes from reading papers and being scholarly, but it also comes from communication and just this dialogue that we have in, in the hallways at meetings and, and just taking the time and being to ask people what's important to them, what do you think of this, what do you think of that, and sharing that information leads us to understand what the greatest impact can be for what we're doing in our research. The advice that I would give to young uh, researchers starting a career is to make sure that you enjoy what you're doing, have fun, um, and to keep your eyes open. So I would work on uh, important problems, but of course you wanna have problems that are, that are soluble.